What's up, USG fam? Welcome back to the Uncommon Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Noah Weiss, and I'm excited to bring this conversation to you today featuring Kyle Stark. Kyle worked in the MLB in a variety of roles for roughly 15 years. He spent three years with the Cleveland Indians as a baseball operations intern and the coordinator of baseball operations and spent over 12 years with the Pittsburgh Pirates as the director of player development, the assistant general manager, and vice president. Since 2020, Kyle has been an entrepreneur working in consulting for his company, the stark contrast. Outside of his professional life, Kyle is a devout follower of Jesus. He is a father, he is a husband, and he truly has interwoven his faith into his career and his personal life. In this conversation, Kyle and I discuss a few really awesome topics. The first is how he got his foot in the door in the MLB, how internships played a a really important and vital role in the start of his career, the qualities of a godly leader and how he lived those out, how he stood out in the organizations he worked for to climb the ladder and receive promotions, some of his key responsibilities as an assistant GM and how he did his job differently as a Christian GM compared to some other non-Christian or secular GMs. This is really a powerful and insightful conversation that I think can impact anyone in sports, not just those working in baseball. So I'm excited to bring it to you. And without further ado, here is this week's conversation with Kyle Stark. Podcasts are pretty common. So what makes the Uncommon Podcast uncommon? Well, it's all in our name. I'm your host, Noah Weiss, and we at Uncommon Sports Group understand the unique pressures and temptations that come with the career in the sport industry. We provide Uncommon training that helps you successfully navigate common challenges. Hit the follow button on this podcast. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Check out our website and become Uncommon. Kyle, thanks so much for being here with me today, brother. It's great to be here. Yeah, man. Excited for our conversation. I would like to start by having you share with us your journey to working in pro baseball. I shared in the intro, your journey in pro baseball was long. 15 years is a a long time, and that is such a blessing. So to share that story with us, how did you break into such a prominent league like the MLB? Yeah, I, I joke with people. I, I say that I you know grew up like a lot of kids wanting to play in the big leagues. Mm-hmm. That was my dream. And unfortunately, I learned at a much younger age than I would have liked that that wasn't going to happen. Um, but that was that's what captured my heart. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to be a part of it. Um, and, you know, it was, it was probably, uh, yeah, I mean, kind of a perfect time of when mm-hmm. uh, the front offices were starting to evolve and, and, and change from just former players to some outside perspectives and influences. Um, but I knew I, I wanted to work in baseball. And so everything I was going to do was going to try to prepare mm-hmm. me for that and differentiate my, myself from that. And so, um, you know, whether it be uh, choosing a school and a major and sport management was kind of new and cool at the mm-hmm. time, which I'm probably dating myself because uh, <laughs> lots of people do sport management now, yeah. uh, to then go in and get my law degree, mm. uh, just to give some background in labor law and a good contract negotiation, uh, no intent to practice, but figured mm-hmm. that would, um, you know, prepare yeah. me and then ultimately going and get my MBA and coaching mm. in, uh, in, in college, getting a chance to mm-hmm. coach at the division one level, just wow. again, uh, perspective, yeah. um, resume, whatever else it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, but so all those things were aimed at trying to get an opportunity. Then I, then the, the next step was the old fashioned mm. uh, handwritten uh, letters to every club, mm. uh, to the general managers of every club and just trying to get uh, a foot in the door. So that wow. process has evolved since then. But that's, yeah. that's kind of my my journey. I love that. I think it's so cool, your intentionality. I remember hearing that same story on the Sports Spectrum podcast with Jason Romano. And I'm just curious, how many responses did you get from those handwritten notes from GMs and other leaders? You know, it's it's fascinating. I would say I, uh, 
it wasn't everybody, but it was a vast majority. I got some kind mm -hmm. of response from it, it, in some ways, you know, I joke in some ways the industry has advanced mm -hmm. and progressed tremendously. In some ways we've probably regressed. I think mm -hmm. actually the responsiveness of, of clubs was probably better back yeah. then. Yeah. Um, now I didn't necessarily hear from the general manager uh, as much, but if, if I wrote 30 clubs, I probably got responses from, 27, 28 mm, of them. Wow. Uh, but there were a handful of, of, uh, of clubs that were specifically mm. where the, the, it wasn't a form letter back. It was, mm. you know, you could tell that this res my, my resume made its way across the general manager's desk wow. and that there was some interest at some level. Wow. Um, and, and actually led to, to phone conversations with, um, I think three clubs, wow. uh, with that. So that I was actually uh, pleasantly surprised by the responsiveness and, yeah. and probably that's one thing I don't know that we do as well in the industry. Yeah. Yeah, uh, today, sure. but it was cool to, to hear back from so many people. Absolutely. I think that can be, it seems like such a small thing, right? To take the time to, to write out a letter and to send in your resume. And certainly it would probably happen a little differently today, maybe over email or some other form yeah. of communication, but it seems simple yet. It really had a, an impact, right? And eventually uh, led into you having an opportunity to work with the Cleveland Indians as an intern. Just kind of share with us, how did that internship come about? Was it the handwritten letters? Was it further reach outs and connections? Then how did you steward that internship opportunity well enough uh, just to continue climbing the ladder in the industry? Yeah, I think Cleveland um, was, was a unique uh, spot. Cleveland, um, you know, going back to, to when John Hart was the general manager there had, has turned out a lot of front office executives, mm. a lot of general managers. Yeah. And I think it's no coincidence based on uh, you know, the type of people they bring in, the environment mm -hmm. that that's created there. Um, they were curious, they were creative, they wanted some different perspectives. And so Cleveland was one of the clubs reach, that reached out. Chris Antonetti mm -hmm. was the assistant general manager at the time. And uh, we talked around coming on board as, as an intern. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward a month or two and, and uh, he reached back out and they had uh, fired their, their major league pitching coach and had mm -hmm. shuffled their pitching coaches. And yeah. so he reached back out and said, hey, would you have interest in coming on board and coaching this wow. summer? Yeah. Uh, which just wasn't on my radar at, at the time. Mm -hmm. But I was like, yeah, I'd love to if, yeah. if that opportunity presents itself. They ended up shuffling the deck. That opportunity wasn't there. But they brought me on as an intern. Mm -hmm. And um, the cool thing about Cleveland was it was a small front office, yeah. a lot of really talented, smart people, mm -hmm. um, and very much focused on uh, figuring it out, being creative. Let's see, Let's look at things differently. Let's try to to solve this problem without necessarily a ton of, mm. Hey, uh, you know, know your spot, just go do your grunt work, whatever else. Yeah. And so there was definitely an element of that, but there was, there was a lot of opportunity, uh, mm. there. And, um, you know, I, I think that I was able to come in, um, from a place of, again, keep in mind, I was a little different spot because it wasn't fresh out mm. of, uh, out of college. Yeah. Having gone and got my law degree and then, um, and then coached as mm. well. Yeah. Um, but I think I showed up and served well. Mm. I think I showed up and, and um, was curious and wanted to learn well. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately, when you get opportunities to contribute, you got to deliver. Mm. And, and I think I was, you know, I was able to do that. So mm. when you deliver well, people trust you and you get yeah. more opportunities. True. And, um, you know, I think the, the other part of the Cleveland opportunity was I got a chance to impact. Mm. A, I got a chance to be exposed and then potentially impact a lot of spaces instead yeah. of just one narrow space. Mm -hmm. And um, that led to some um, some cool opportunities that led to a broader perspective, led to just led to um, some cool relationships. It yeah. was really uh, opportunistic there. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes it can be difficult for young professionals to maybe really enjoy an internship or, or take advantage of it because it does seem like, Oh, I'm just kind of doing the grunt work. I'm not really a part of it. I'm just seasonal or I'm just for, for the specific time of the year. I, I was an intern for two summers for the Colts for one month of training camp. It was like the month of July and some of August. And I always thought it was such a bummer. Like, man, I miss out on the whole season, but it did teach me a lot. And I think when you're in the building, whether it be a month or six months, right. Or even a full year as a seasonal intern, you can really grow and, and take advantage of those in a way that leads to other opportunities down the line. So I, I love that that's a part of your journey. You look at your, your LinkedIn page is where I found all of these opportunities that you were a part of. It starts as an intern and you just see kind of the steady progression that, that you had in the industry. And I think that's a testament to your work and taking advantage of those opportunities. 
I think on a similar vein, right, you had the opportunity to be the director of a minor league team up in Pittsburgh uh, for the Pittsburgh uh, farm team in, in your late 20s, right, which is really an incredible opportunity uh, at such a young age. And so I think the question that any young person would have, whether they want to work in baseball or not, how did you prepare yourself for having that opportunity of leadership as a director, despite your young age and inexperience? Yeah, I think it probably depends on who you ask whether I was prepared or not. I, I don't know that any of us are ever prepared. And I'm yeah. sure there's some people that worked with me early on uh, that were like, he wasn't prepared at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it, it comes down to, uh, so I think a couple of things. I think one, we talked about the intentionality, right, in terms of being very intentional with, even if you haven't mapped out the path, mm -hmm. I, I do think that, um, you know, especially from, from a place of faith, uh, sometimes we can micromanage our our uh, plan and God's laughing at us mm. saying, hey, you know, are you going to let me in on this <laughs> as yeah. well? Uh, but having some intent of generally where are we going? Mm. And and so then every experience and opportunity, I can connect to that. So you make you maximize those opportunities. There's no yeah. wasted opportunity. Yeah, I think there's the other part of of recognizing that every experience, every um, relationship, every um you know, connection, those are all opportunities to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what not to do, sometimes what to do. Um, sometimes just in terms of, hey, for future reference, this might be somebody you want to have uh, in your back pocket down mm -hmm. the road. Yeah. And um, I think a lot of times we're in such a rush to get to the next. Yeah. I see this all the time in terms of people are worried about the next job. How do I get to the next job? Let's just focus on, on doing the job mm -hmm. uh, really well. Um, not only will people notice that, but we're, our experiences are going to be richer. Our lessons are going to be deeper mm -hmm. so that we can then go apply those. So I think that combination of intention mm -hmm. along with, um, with, um, you know, being fully committed to the mm -hmm. opportunity in, in front of you yeah. and, and making sense of the experiences you go through yeah. allows you to have a more coherent leadership philosophy, allows you to have a more intentional leadership philosophy, mm -hmm. allows you to have, not that you're going to have everything figured out, but you're going in with a better uh, blueprint, at least, to be able to respond to the challenges that, that are thrown your way. Absolutely. And I think it's just really encouraging to hear that from you. Uh, I think for our listeners, too, right, that they may have a fear of like, well, if I'm, if I'm ever put in a position of being a leader, right, being in a position as you were as a director, would I be ready? And I think it's encouraging to know that you can be, right? even though if you don't maybe have all of the skills necessary, you can pick up on some of those or maybe... If you don't have a lot of experience in certain areas, you can learn uh, and become a and become a powerful leader. And I think the question that, that I'd like to ask off of that is, you think about right. You were obviously in a position as a director, but we'll talk about this later. You had roles all the way up to assistant GM and vice president within the Pirates, and I think a key success, part of success to any part of being in that position is leadership and how to be a good godly leader. So. What are some of those qualities that a great godly leader in the sport industry professionally would live out? And how did you live those out during your time with the Pirates? Yeah, I think but before I answer that, I'll just uh, jump on something that you kind of shared there in terms of like, yeah. if we're if we are waiting till we get the opportunity hmm. to figure out how to lead well, it's too late. Yeah. Right. So um, I think this ability to maximize where we're at and learn from it and constantly develop that is critical because all of our experiences are preparing us for something. Hmm. And, and again, if we get ahead of ourselves and rush, we're going to, we're going to miss those. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, once you, once you get there, you start talking about, okay, what, what does that look like? I think this is important for all of us to decide yeah. what is my leadership philosophy? What is, what are my guiding principles? Mm. Um, and, and over time, um, you know, I'll share. So I, I think we start with, um, you know, and I, I had, you know, it's funny when I'll do podcasts or meet people, they're like, hey, tell me a, a great book I should read. And there's a lot of good ones. Yeah. And I'll say the Bible and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what else? I'm like, no, let's let's make sure we really understand mm -hmm. that at the depth we, yeah. we need to understand that. And I haven't always been there uh, with that, but that gives us our blueprint, right? It gives yeah. us our blueprint for leadership. It, it shows us the best leader ever uh, in, mm -hmm. in Jesus uh, on how he navigated things. So I'll give you kind of three things that I think we can connect to Jesus, but, but more importantly, not more importantly, that, that uh, more practically mm -hmm. they show up in the real world every day. Yeah. Uh, and the first one is that whenever I talk with, uh, you know, players and I'll ask them, hey, best coach you ever played for and ask them why they always 
without fail, one of the big reasons is because the person was consistent. Mm. They knew what they were going to get every single day from that person. Yeah. And so I think that first part is this reminder that uh, more is caught than taught, that it's mm. the consistency we're showing up. Yep. There's so much unpredictability around us, um, which ultimately the only way we can do this is if we're authentic. We know who we are. We like who we are and we can consistently be who we are. Mm. So that first piece is that self-leadership piece of allowing myself to consistently be the best version of myself every day. That's great. So that people have, can see a model of what that looks like. Mm. I think the second big thing with, with that is this idea that it's not about you, right? Mm. It's all, it is about your people. Nobody cares if you had a good day. Nobody cares how you're performing. Mm. Uh, ultimately, your job is to create an environment, get the right people in the right spots for them to go achieve and perform yeah. well. So this idea, it's not about me um, and mm. I need to serve. Yeah. Um, the flip side of that, the third thing that I think stands out is that it is all about you, this sense of responsibility, and that mm. if things aren't going well, yeah. um, you've it's on you to figure out how to solve it. And that can be, not that you have to have all the answers, mm. but you have to assume that responsibility. You can't run from that responsibility. Yeah. And so that can be, uh, you know, if you've got somebody that's not performing well, you either, you either hired mm. them, you put them in that spot, you haven't developed them, you haven't led them well, whatever else, and you've got to mm. own that. And I think a lot of times as leaders, it's easy to push it off onto somebody else. You hear the coach blame the players. You hear the yeah. leader blame the coaches. You hear people, and you know, as soon as we go to that blame game, then we're, we're not leading from a good spot. So, again, I think the, the ability consistent, which mm. is leading yourself, it's the idea of serving others, uh, but not like, hey, I'm on my hands and knees just trying to meet all yeah. your needs. No, it's recognizing my job is to get the most out of you. It's not about me. Hmm. And then this this piece of uh, assuming responsibility not shine from that, and, and ultimately you've got to figure out how to solve it. Yeah, love the practicality of those, and I think that's really like helpful in seeing that while it's challenging to be a good leader, and those things you just mentioned, they're not easy to live out on a day to day basis, but they are practical and they are simple, right? Th those things are not super hard to understand; they are hard to live out. And I think it's encouraging for for our young people, going back to what you said initially, is is you have to start doing this stuff leadership-wise early, right, before you are actually in a position of leadership. You think about some of the best coaches in professional sports. I, I really like Mike Tomlin. I think he's a great leader, and you're a Pittsburgh guy, uh, just a tremendous leader. I mean, it's not that Mike Tomlin woke up one day as the head coach of the Steelers and was a tremendous leader that, that day, right? It was things he was doing prior to that. Uh, that helped him form into the leader that he is. And so I think for our listeners, that's a tremendous reminder that even if you are the intern or even if you are the GA or the student manager, right, you can still practice being a good leader in preparation for the day that you are. And I really like that point. That's something that really stood out to me. And, uh, you know, Kyle, I, I want to get back into your journey, right, You're walking through your, your time, going through the the majors. And during your time in Pittsburgh, you eventually climbed the ladder, as I mentioned, to become the assistant general manager for the Pirates. And I think something that our listeners may struggle to understand is how do you make yourself stand out within an organization, right? You spent a long time with the Pirates. I think it was 12 years, correct me if I'm wrong, roughly 12 years. And the whole time you were there, you continuously made promotion after promotion, climbed the ladder. So how did you make yourself stand out to earn that promotion to become the assistant GM and what were some of the key responsibilities you had in that role? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's really no different than the, the conversation we were having around the, the internship piece, right. In terms of how do we maximize um, those opportunities we have. Um, and, you know, I think really when you get down to it, I mean, one of the, um, you know, I think one of the things that, um, just an analogy of talking about like coaches, right? And when coaches decide who they're going to play, mm. a lot of times it comes down to who do I trust? Yeah. Who do I trust that's going to be able to go out there and execute? And I think it's it's really no different in in terms of uh, other roles within an organization. So yep. it's a trust factor. And if you think about trust, we can think about trust a lot of different ways. There's a lot of people smarter mm. than me that have chopped mm. up trust, but there's a character piece, right? Do I trust this person, their character? Um, there's a competency piece, right? Do I trust this person's ability to go perform and execute and deliver? And then there's probably a connection piece, right? Do I trust this person as a teammate, um, you know, and the relational side of things? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think ultimately we've got to answer that, those questions affirmatively mm -hmm. to get more opportunity. Yeah. Uh, we we got to answer those questions affirmatively to continue to get employed, but we yeah, have to answer right. those questions affirmatively and probably at some different levels. 
mm. in order to get promoted. Yeah. Um, I think part of that is also recognizing that um, I think a lot of times we think about promotions uh, very linearly. Like mm. if I do this really well, then it's the next step. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times those are different skill sets needed. Right. And I think whether that's the employee going through it or whether it's the leader thinking, hey, this is my best performer, I'm going to promote him to the next mm, spot. Yeah, it may be a different skill set. And we need to be honest about that and be aware of that. Are we cultivating that? Is that a good fit? Mm. Do I trust them to be able to go deliver in that space? So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that journey is ultimately a matter of being able to answer that question for those above, above us generally, but then also specifically to a role. Do I trust them to be able to go deliver? And yeah. um and if the answer is yes, then people get more opportunities. Absolutely. I love that. And, and I love the the character and, and competency portion of your answer. I think that's also biblical as well. I think you yeah. think about David, right? We talk about David all the time, right? He's just, he's kind of the most famous Bible character, at least in my time being in church, but he had high character, right? God said he was a man after his own heart, but he was good at what he did, right? He had, he yeah. had competency as a leader. And I think it's Psalm 76 or 79 it talks specifically about how that's important to have both of those. Um, and I'll, I'll have to look that up and, and share that in the show notes. But that it, it's amazing to see that what you just said is actually a, a tip from Scripture, as you mentioned earlier uh, in some answers before that. So, yeah, I think that's... Well, just to jump in on that, too, yeah, though, I mean, I yeah. think, again, I joke around that, that that is the best leadership manual we have, the best peak performance manual yeah. we have is there. Yeah. And so anything that I think, it's funny, like people be like, man, that's really good. Where'd you get that? If mm. it's really good, I didn't come up with it. It's it's biblical. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think just as you mentioned, David, which fires me up as a man after God's own heart, failed miserably in a specific space. And what was the downfall was a character uh, I- issue at that time, mm-hmm. which led to some competency things in, in yeah. that specific situation. Yeah. Um, both encouraging for me in terms of man after God's own heart could screw up that bad. Right, right. Um, but also as you gain clarity of why is he a man after God's own heart? Cause he continued to seek him. Mm. Um, and, and that's a, a great reminder for me. It is. Yeah. And I think that is something and I'll just kind of piggyback off that as well. You know, David's failure was, was very like worse than something that I think you and I would probably hopefully, <laughs> hopefully do. Um, and, and I think what it does encourage us with that story is that God did restore him. Um, and Psalm 51 is one of my favorite Psalms. It is Psalm of repentance and, and turning back towards the ways of, of the Lord. And so, yeah, there is, there is much grace that God has to pour out for us. So and if, when, when we do fail, not if, when we do fail, uh, the Lord is there to, to help us walk through that. So I love Which that is point. a great leadership reminder for all of us too, but our people are not expecting us to be perfect. Mm, they are amen. expecting us to be authentic. They are expecting us to show up and care about them. Uh, we are, they are expecting a level of competency, but nobody's yeah. expecting us to be perfect. Amen. I think a lot of times those pressures we feel ourselves. And so the ability to give ourselves some grace mm. and then to be humble and say, I don't know, or yeah. I screwed that up. Uh, you know, and I, I haven't always been great at that, um, mm. but th- those things go a long way. Absolutely. They definitely do. And And I think that's, that, that's humility at work, right? And I think that's also a character trait of, of those who are walking with Christ. And I, I think for, for those of us that may not be as familiar with the industry, like myself, in terms of the, the world of baseball, what were some of the key responsibilities and things that you were in charge of in your role as the assistant GM with the Pirates? Yeah, so starting off, uh, as you mentioned, in terms of director of development, I oversaw our minor league system. So um, we started off with... Um, I think eight, uh, seven, seven or eight stateside uh, minor league teams, um, plus mm. uh, an operation in the Dominican Republic and an operation in Venezuela. We consolidated our Latin American operation to just in the Dominican, and over time, we, um, you know, baseball has has. Um, yeah, has d- reduced the number of minor league teams. But mm-hmm. so it started with overseeing um, not just player development, but our coach development, mm-hmm. our staff development to try to um, the thought was if we pour into our coaches, they'll pour into the players and we get the most out of our players. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so so that's where that started. Then it evolved over time. Uh, and the cool thing is similar to in, in Cleveland, where mm-hmm. uh, small front office, lots of opportunities. Same thing in Pittsburgh. When I first got hired as director of development, we didn't have an assistant GM. Mm. Uh, so it was the general manager, a director of scouting and a director of development. Wow. Um, and then over time, the director of scouting and myself grew into those assistant GM roles, which meant um, probably a more formal uh, structure of what was already happening in terms mm. of being involved in some other areas. Yeah. Um, 
And then eventually I, I got to a spot where I was overseeing our scouting and our development operations. So mm. amateur scouting, international scouting, professional scouting, and our, our development, um, as well as just being, you know, walking alongside our general manager mm. and the rest of our leadership team with the actual major league club, because uh, mm. we wanted to make sure everything was connected. Yeah. It's so cool. I, I think for a lot of our listeners, right, just the world of baseball is it's it's very different. I think you would you would agree with that that across all of professional sports and the major sports leagues around the world, it has a uniqueness to it. Uh, I think in terms of the amount of players that are within one system, the farm system, it's just it's so different. I, I'm a big football guy, and and that's just it's nothing like what the NFL is. It's so different, uh, but it's it's really cool in that way. And I think the, in terms of what you had responsibility over. Um, very, very good experience and, and things to, uh, to learn from, from, from what you did. I think a challenging part of working in a baseball front office is you have to fire people. They have to hire people. You have to cut players. You have to, you have to judge players based on performance and, and how well they're doing, not really based on character. And sometimes that may have been a factor, but oftentimes more so the, the play on the field how did you balance the command from Christ to love our neighbor as ourselves, right? To practice patience and humility, you know, ha- have our speech seasoned with salt, things of that nature, with your responsibility to build a roster in a front office that was really built to have success on the field. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a, a great reminder, and and you know, I think, you know, I think this space, like. It, I think a lot of things in life we can um, end up with two um, polar opposites. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I just think the more I do this, the more I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle of those, the tension between those two. And so I think a lot of times with whether it's player or staff evaluation and, and, and career decisions, we can err on the side of we're not going to get too close of them there. You know, uh, there's no personal relationship. There's no personal connection. It's a business and, and you go down that road. Yeah. And in some ways that, that, uh, I think it makes it maybe easier on the decision maker. Um, but I don't, mm. I don't believe you're getting the most out of people when that's the case. Yeah. Um, but you can also swing the pendulum too far the other way. And it's so relational and so can, uh, emotionally connected. And it's so the individual and trying to do what's mm. best for the individual and everything else. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's a lot of uh, benefits to that. There's also some potential challenges to that yeah. approach. So you start talking yeah. about the, kind of the tension between the two of them. A few things that helped crystallize for me, specifically when you start talking about making hard decisions on people's livelihoods. Um, and, and that's part of, you know, in terms of how I frame things out, that this is you're making a decision on somebody's livelihood. Mm. And so we can't take that lightly. Yeah, true. Um, so I, I think the first thing is the recognition that I have a responsibility to the organization and everyone mm. in it, not just the individual. Mm. Yeah, because I think sometimes we can be on that side where you know I care so much about this person, what's best for this person? I don't want to fire this person. Yeah, and it's like yeah, but there's a bunch of other high performers over here that are like, dude, we're not very good if we keep that guy around. Mm. Um, and so I think there is that re- that reminder for myself that my responsibility isn't just to the individual; it's to mm. all the individuals and ultimately the collective organization. Nothing happens in a vacuum. Mm. Um, so I think there's that part. I think the second part is the. Uh, the humility piece of I'm not perfect. I don't have it all figured out. I mm. might be wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, cause I think sometimes I would catch myself thinking the best place for this person was with us. Cause we were going to maximize their development. And um, I was just reminded a few different times. My wife was one of the best at reminding me of <laughs> this, of really you think God needs you in order to maximize that person's career. <laughs> right. And I was like, no, I guess you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Again, that elevation, we think ourselves are too important or we think our space is too important. And to be able to humble ourselves and say, Mm. um, you know, God's plan is bigger than this. I may be wrong anyways. You know, Mm. when I make a decision, who knows? Mm. Um, You know, we tried to build in some things that we probably stuck with people longer. Mm. Some people, you know, make a decision sooner. We try to stick with people longer because we Mm. wanted to give we were a development organization. We wanted to give people an opportunity to grow and get better. Mm-hmm. And so we wanted to give people lots of opportunity. Yeah. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's a reminder of I, I'm not perfect. I don't have this yeah. figured out. Yeah. Um, and then I think the last part of it is the piece of, um, you know, the golden rule, um, mm-hmm. do on others as you'd want them to do to you. Yeah. And so um, there, you're not going to make someone feel good in mm-hmm. that when you sit down and give them that news. Yeah. Um but I can create confusion. I can make it messier. I can do whatever else if mm. I am not just upfront and honest with, hey, 
here's yeah. the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm going to do it with grace. I'm going to do it with care. I'm going to do it with support. Say, hey, if there's mm -hmm. anything we can do, don't hesitate to let us know. We want mm -hmm. to help you continue to to thrive. But I also can't get my feelings hurt if that person's mad at me and doesn't want right. to hear that. That's fine. Um, the big thing for me with all of this is, um, you know, people are, will ask for specific tactics on how to have this conversation. Right. You can't come up with a perfect script that's going to undo a year, three years, five years, 10 years of bad relationship. Mm. And so our hope was that that person felt cared for, they would felt supported, they would felt challenged, that they were a better person mm. and that they felt that from us, that we cared about them um, so that they received it in context. Yeah. As opposed to if if you're not doing any of those things and all of a sudden I try to deliver a perfect script, mm. that's not going to be received. The relationship's bigger than that interaction. Yeah. And, you know, my hope was that our, we manage that relationship in such a way that um, if and when we had to get to that spot, yeah. um, you know, it, it was received as, as well as it could. Knowing that's full well, I can't control that and I'm not going to make it perfect. Yeah. I love those points you made. I think a, a struggle that young professionals can have, especially Christian young professionals, is... Will my faith cause me to be worse at my job, right? Especially in the cutthroat industry of sports, like the fear can be like, well, you know, I, I feel like I'm going to lose out, out on performance because I'm not as cutthroat or I don't have quite the same demeanor. Christ calls me to do things in a different way and, and that's going to hold me back. And I think what you did is you outlined a way, right? And obviously a very godly way of doing the job well, but in a way that does still honor Christ and that backs up what you believe. I think that's... It can happen in, in any part of the industry. I, I was fortunate enough during my college years to work for a men's basketball coach when I was a student manager who was a believer, but he was really good at what he did. And he taught the young guys well, and he was a great coach and a great mentor. And I think he, he learned that balance just as you did, is that's a possible thing to do. So I love that you shared that, especially just in the hard hardest parts of what you had to do. Uh, in your role with with the Pirates as assistant well, GM, and let to, to to go one step further with that, no, I think yeah. this is a this is a disconnect that I probably struggle with a little bit. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot of times I'll go into you know a, a Christian organization or whatever else, and like they're afraid to talk about winning, or they're afraid to talk about um, competing, or they're afraid to talk about high standards. Um, yeah, I just I think there's nothing in the Bible that says Jesus didn't want to perform at a really mm -hmm. high level. Mm -hmm. Now he cared about people. He yeah. didn't see people as a means to an end. The relationships mattered for yep. sure. Uh, but I don't read anywhere in Scripture where it says lower the bar, lower expectations, mm -hmm. and we're good with that. Um, in yeah. fact, pretty cons in fact, one hundred percent consistently throughout yeah. the Bible, uh, it talks about doing all things un unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, soul, and mind unto the Lord. Yeah. This that's a higher standard. Yeah. And I think a lot of times when we fall into this trap of I don't know if I can do both. Um, now I, I think there is a legitimate conversation on um, hours committed and what does that look like from a family. I think those things are all legit. But as yeah. far as having a really high standard. All I know is the best I've ever been around in any facet of life, they stand for something and they're mm. sold out to it. Yeah. That's pretty much what our faith is supposed to be about. So Agreed. <laughs> that disconnect, I you know, I think a lot of times becomes yeah. a cop out or excuse for Christians to lower the bar and yeah. make excuses about some things. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, yeah, I think in terms of how we're called to live out our faith, there is a high standard in that. And Colossians 3.23, I think you, you kind of referenced yep. that verse of, Work for all, work towards all things as if you're working for the Lord, not not for yep. man. I mean, that that's a powerful statement, right? Even when you're doing something really simple, right? If you're if you're doing a remodel to your kitchen or something, right? It's yep. for it's for the Lord, right? And I think that changes how we view it, and, and it sets the bar pretty high for us. So I love that yep. you made that point. And, and kind of here on a, on a similar vein as well, there, there's 30 MLB assistant GMs, right, in in the world at one time. I think that's pretty amazing to think about where you are at, right? It, it may be less if some teams don't have that position, right? And so how did you make yourself stand out as a Christian in that role as compared to maybe how the typical uh, assistant GM would would do their job? How did you make your your role different as a believer? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it comes down to, um, I, I think if, if you think about um, performance or culture, organizations, or whatever else, you can really think about people and process, right? So you think about the results side, the process side, and you think about the relationships, the people side. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where our faith should differentiate how we navigate those mm -hmm. two. So, um, you know, the hope is 
that how we treat people, how we, mm. uh, the relationships we build, the uh, ability to pour into people, the ability to serve people, the ability to, um, yeah, uh, you know, um, have people's back and some of those types of things. You hope that that stands yeah. out um, from a faith standpoint and not because I'm getting anything in return. A yeah. uh, quick story. I had a guy tell me, a veteran baseball guy one time say, you know, the longer you do this, the less you'll trust people because you'll get burned. And I'm like, get burned every day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not doing True this enough. because it's, it's not going to be a conditional, um, type of, mm. of approach in terms of how I care about you and how I lead you. It's going to yeah. be unconditional as best I can, which I can only do that through him. Amen. Uh, so there's that relational side. And then I think the, the, the uh, results side, the process side is that the bar is going to be higher. The standards and expectations mm. are going to be higher. We are going to uh, approach every test from a Colossians three twenty three mm. uh, point of view. Um, and and that, that so I think both of those both really high competency and execution mm -hmm. and results, but also how we treat people in the process and how we show up for people in the process, mm -hmm. um, that that looks a little bit different. It's really easy to get sucked into normal. Like yeah. I mean, that's uh, most places wherever you're at. It's like yeah, it's normal. And mm -hmm. so how. Do, how do you ultimately at the end of the day, which I love you guys are uncommon sports group. Yeah. Uh, we spent, we used a lot of Tony Dungy stuff and talked mm -hmm. about the different, Hey, that's common. That's normal. And we would joke around that. Hey, you know, whatever, pick whatever place is hiring. If you want to go do that, right. people are going to stand out here as uncommon. And, and yeah. that's, that's going to look a little differently. And I think ultimately for those of us who are guided by faith, want that to be mm -hmm. that people notice, Hey, there's something different about you. What is it? Yeah. And then we can ultimately point to him as opposed to, Hey, Kyle's great. This yeah. Kyle's not great. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I, th I think that's really the heart and soul of, of what we do as a ministry, right? Is that this industry of sport, it doesn't matter if you're the assistant GM or if you're the if you're the intern, is that the work that you do and the way that you treat people and the way that you interact and, and, and walk and talk through the, the facility and through the stadium would stand out and show others who Christ really is, be the hands and feet um, and living uncommon because that, that lifestyle, the way that you would choose to do that as a Christian is different. It is unique. Mm -hmm. It is rare in most cases. So I love that you shared that too. I mean, that you were able to do that in your role. Um, certainly not perfectly because none of us are, but we're able to strive to do that and, and glorify the Lord. Um, and, and I love one point that you made too as well, that you can't expect anything in return. If you're treating people well and trying to do things right by what God has called you to do, there can't be this expectation of, well, now I deserve something right from God or from others. But it's, that's not how it works. He's not a genie, and others really may not receive that the same way. So I love that yeah. you made that point point as well. You know, and one thing you mentioned uh, is the challenge of working in this industry, Kyle, is the the amount of hours right that you have to work. And you worked in in baseball in 160 plus games, right? There's really a constant season; it really never stops, right? It's, it's a it's a constant uh, grind in, in the majors. And so, how did you balance? Family, faith, life, and career. How did you make those things kind of work together to where you had time for family, time for faith, and time to do your job well? Yeah, so I'll answer that by saying I didn't. Um, and part of that, I think, is um, some real reality versus what sounds good in theory. I, I think, and I think ultimately some of it is, you know, at times I poorly executed versus uh, executed at a high level. Um, this notion of balance, uh, we, we need to let go of, like, especially mm. if we're looking, typically how we look at balance as like the scales of justice and everything's equal. Right. It's just not real. Yep. Um, if you want to be great at something, you by definition are going to dedicate more time to it than other people are. Mm. Um, and so I, I think some of it's just even our expectations of how we go into this and what we want. And it's like, no, if, if you're not good with, a big part of your uh, personal, uh, social, all these different sides getting filled in the professional bucket. If you're not good with that, then it's don't work in sport. Um, yeah. If you want a separate life, if you want to, leave, and or don't get mad when you don't get promotions and don't get opportunities. It's just right. the, the reality of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I think the key is we can't then use that as an excuse to just be a horrible father and husband. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I know at times I did not do as well. Um, thankfully, I married well, and my wife's a saint, and mm. she, um, yeah, was a huge part of raising our, our two boys. If she's not in the picture, we're in a different spot. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I, I think I married while well, I was protected that way. I think the other part that um, we were able to do was we were intentional about merging those two worlds. Mm. And so I was on the road a lot. So we traveled a lot. Mm. If we were going to spend time together, um, we would do uh, we would do marriage retreats with our mm. with our uh, s- staff and their spouses. Yeah. And my wife would would share that if you're not seeing this as a calling for yourself as well, you're going to resent each other. It's going to be miserable. Mm. So. I share all that in terms of, I think we have to let go of this idea of balance and separate and equal. That's not real. We're going to live in tension. I'm trying to be the Mm. uh, best leader I can, the best father I can, the best husband I can. And I need to be aware of seasons, Mm -hmm. not literal seasons of the season, although sometimes that's what it is. But there's seasons of life where I'm probably going to be a little bit out of whack in terms of where I'm spending time and energy. Mm -hmm. And we got to be aware of that and compensate for that and navigate that and be okay with that. Yeah. Um, but that relationship has to be really connected to be able to navigate those things together as opposed to separate. I mm. think too often we try to do these things separately. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Um, as, as opposed as opposed to connect, if that makes sense. It does. Absolutely. It's, it's great advice. And I love the honesty too, right? That if you're going to be in this industry, it's just the balance really isn't going to be there. It's just the truth of it. it, it and I love it. Yeah, if you want a nice social life and uh, quality time off and, and, uh, you know, whatever else, um, it's oh, just, it's not industry. real. It's not going to happen. So you better see yeah. this as a calling, a mm. lifestyle, a, an integrated thing, yeah. because if you're going to try to chop it up, I, you, you can't do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I share this story. I think I've shared it maybe three times on this podcast, but my, my coach, when I was at Butler, he shared with me exactly almost what you just said of, if you're going to be in this industry, it needs to be a lifestyle, not just for you, but for your family, right? And, yeah. and his wife and kids were always around the, the practice facility. They traveled the games from time to time. And so they were immersed in it just as much as he was. And I think that's how they made it work, right? It may be different for others, but I yeah. think to your point, right, it has to be a lifestyle, not just for you, but for your family. And they have to be on board. Now, now I'll add to that. Yeah. The flip side is uh, I think sometimes we use that as an excuse to just not be a good father and husband yeah, yeah. and be like, well, you know, it's this is what we signed up for and everything else it's yeah. like um you know are you do you have mm. dedicated time yeah. uh with your wife dedicated time with your kids dedicated time absolutely um you know are you do you have some um element of getting away and having some different perspective um because if i'm just consumed with my work and i've talked myself mm. into well that's the way it is yeah um that's a that's a that's an excuse as well mm. um good point. you know i think we uh you know, I, I've shared with in some ways being married and having kids made me not as good a leader as I could have been because mm-hmm. I was distracted in terms of um, time and energy and whatever else. At the same time, I was a way better leader because mm-hmm. I'm married and have kids. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because my wife has made me a way better uh, man, has made me a way better leader. Um, having kids provides so much more perspective a, as far as mm-hmm. leading and developing and everything. So, um, it is harder, yeah. uh, but it's but it's got a chance to be better as long as um, we've got some good perspective. We got our, our ultimate priorities in order. Um, and, you know, I think that's the, the one thing my wife and I always talked about is that uh, hopefully my wife only has there's only one person who can fill her uh, yeah. need of a husband and only one person who can fill my kids yeah. need as a yeah. father. And I need to be filling that. Um, Otherwise, you got problems. I love that. Absolutely. It's so true, right? That that dynamic, even as believers, right? The Ephesians 5, like love your Christ, or sorry, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Um, That's that's a high calling. And then that that needs to be. And it's going to look different. It's going to look different in sport, right? I mean, if you're comparing. Uh, I mean, this was a big one. I think for spouses to under, understand, mm. you know, this is a big one for my wife. If if she's in a church group with a bunch of, um, you know, if she's in a small group with a bunch of people that are their husbands or, or spouses or whatever are, you know, a nine to five job and they're complaining because somebody worked late again and missed dinner, like that's, it's just going to look different. We can't compare those worlds. Yeah, true. Um, so that, that awareness is important. Absolutely. It is. It, it's so important. And that communication on the front end as well of, of what your goals and aspirations are, I think, is before you get married. Right. So they, yeah. so they know what's what's coming. That's really good. Um, you know, and Kyle, you, you talked about, right, just kind of this journey through through the industry of, of baseball. And then most recently, you have sort of exited that a little bit and have transitioned into doing some consulting work through your own company uh, called The Stark Contrast. So what led you to move on from working full-time in baseball and, and become really an entrepreneur? 
Um, so I was on the receiving end of that, of one of those conversations about you're fired. We want you to go work somewhere else. Um, yeah, the fall of, of 2019 regime change, mm -hmm. uh, shuffling the deck and, um, and hey, after 12 years, it was, it was time yeah. for, for some, for some things to move on quick side note. My wife had been praying for a couple of years that God would take me out of uh, baseball. Mm. I joked with her that a little heads up on that would be, would be helpful. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I was, I was fired in the fall of, of November of, of 2019. Mm. And my wife, uh, said to me, Hey, um, can you give me six months? I need six months, uh, mm. before you jump back in. And, um, I said, sure. And, uh, three months later, four months later, uh, COVID happened. The world shut down. Uh, we found ourselves spent a lot of time together and enjoying it. Mm. And, um, I started having some different people reach out that I developed relationships with over the years to say, Hey, would you come spend some time with my company or my team or my uh, organization or with me as a leader, as a coach, whatever. Mm. And so it just kind of organically happened. I joked, I uh, have a ton of respect. I always used consultants. I have a ton of respect for consultants, but I was like, I'm never going to be a consultant. I like being in the trenches, mm. uh, moving things forward. And, uh, but God's got to, you know, bigger yeah. plan and a little sense of humor sometimes when he laughs yeah. and we tell him what we want to do. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so it, and it was a perfect time in our lives where my, uh, my youngest son, awesome kid, awesome young man now getting ready to graduate and head to college, wow. um, needed dad around more. Hmm. And so have been able to be way more um, flexible with our time with where we're spending our energy and ultimately getting a chance to spend time with some really good leaders and coaches in a variety mm. of different arenas, um, which has provided some different perspective and, and some uh, some creativity and some uh, variety, which which I've really enjoyed. Mm. That's so cool. It's amazing how God does work in our lives in just unexpected ways. And I think that's an awesome way, right, to transition you into this new stage of life. And you've been doing this for what three, four years now? I guess since twenty twenty. Yeah, so four or four five years. years. My uh, quick sidebar: you, again, when you think about um, blessings and how God works. So, uh, my my both my uh, both of our boys had gone to a uh, uh, Christian sports camp called Summer's Best Two Weeks, mm. uh, two week overnight camp, all about competition uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Both ha had amazing um, experiences with it, and. Uh, our youngest was going to camp. I think it was his last year there or whatever. And they asked him to do um, a, a devotional in front of all camps. So a couple hundred kids, wow. a few hundred kids. And uh, he actually did a devotional. I had been fired. He did a devotional on Jeremiah 29, 11 and talked about it in terms of where a lot of times uh, we can uh, get a little sideways with our interpretation of that verse. Mm -hmm. And he uh, shared it in terms of uh, God working things out for good mm -hmm. in the context of me getting fired and being around more. And uh, wow. yeah, one of those moments where you're really proud of, of your kid yeah. and, uh, um, and, and, and the perspective that, that comes with it mm -hmm. and who knows what God's got in store, but it's been yeah. a really good season of our life and really fun to be able to work with, some really high speed people and organizations mm, yeah. that I would not have had time to do um, in the past. It's amazing. It's amazing, Kyle. And I'll give you an opportunity here to do some consulting for our listeners. What is some <laughs> advice you would give any young professional listening as they journey through the sport industry as a Christian professional? Yeah, no, I think it's, um, we're, we're a function of our, um, our experiences and, and our relationships, right? So I think it's really a matter of, of um, being intentional uh, to maximize those and mm. not from a uh, transactional side of just about what can I get out of it. Um, ultimately, you want to serve and um, be respectful, but at the same time, be intentional with capitalizing on the, on the things you go through. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think every, um, Every person is a chance to learn something, mm -hmm. to g gain a better understanding. Um, some of it's just to gain a better understanding of how uniquely gifted and different we all are wired. Yeah. Uh, but some of it's going to be experiences they've had, um, lessons that they've, you know, let's to be intentional, learn from other people's lessons. Mm. Um, and then I think the experience is the uh, same thing of really fully committing to the experience in front of me, not looking ahead, not skipping ahead, not thinking about what's next but to experience it and then be intentional about reviewing and making mm. sense of what you just went through. What are some lessons learned? What are some things that stood out? Uh, we're in such a rush to move on to the next thing that um, a lot of times um, 
you know, we miss opportunities to really learn things. Mm -hmm. I, I laugh because everybody's obsessed with growth mindset and learning. And yeah. it's all about what books, podcasts, it's all consumption mm -hmm. of information. Yeah. It's not really necessarily growing. Like we right. have to translate that and apply it and right. try to get better and improve. So I've got to, the only way I can do that is if I pause and I reflect on some things and I make sense of what I went through so I can adjust and go do it better. Mm -hmm. um, not yeah, to yeah. take anything away from podcasts and books. They're awesome. Yep. But we hope that it's not just consumption, yeah. <laughs> that it's then True. showing up in, in some other ways. Um, so it's a long winded way of saying people say humble, try to learn from every um every experience and make sense of things as you mm. go along the way, being really intentional with our experiences and the people that we're, we come in contact with. Mm, it's great encouragement and great, great advice, right? I think of the the quote, bloom where you planted, right? Be, be present where you are and allow God to really transform you in that season because it's for a purpose, right? It's for a reason. So well said, Kyle. And just thanks for your time, brother. Appreciate your, your words and sharing your story. And we just look forward to seeing what God does in your life as you move forward. No, I appreciate getting a chance to spend some time with you guys. Um, feel big fan of Uncommon Sports Group, and I got a soft spot for uh, the world of sport, the things we can learn in sport, the cool opportunities we can have with sport, and specifically how what sport mm. can teach us about our faith and how we can grow in our faith uh, mm. through sport. So I appreciate you giving me a chance to spend some time with you guys today. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Uncommon Podcast. Be sure to follow, like, or subscribe to the podcast on your preferred listening platform so you don't miss an episode. If you would like to get involved with Uncommon Sports Group and our ministries, tap the link in the description to learn more about ways you can engage with the USG community. Until next time, we pray that you will strive to be uncommon by glorifying the name of God in whatever you may do. See you next time.